This is an NBC News special report, Calamity in Space. I'm Bob Madigan. It appears as if all seven astronauts aboard the shuttle Challenger are dead, killed shortly after liftoff when the shuttle blew up this morning. It looked like a normal launch as the space shuttle Challenger left the launch pad from Cape Canaveral in a plume of orange flame and white smoke. It was off for its tenth mission in space. Then in little more than a minute, a huge fiery explosion, and all we could see were entrails of smoke going off in all directions. The mission control went silent. A moment later, a stunned mission controller said the vehicle has exploded. Correspondent Jay Barbary is on the live line from Cape Canaveral. Jay? Well, the rescue operation, Bob, is taking place now 18 miles east of us, uh, out over the Atlantic. There are paramedics in the water. There are helicopters, boats. Everything that can be done is being done. But without question, there's very little that can be done. We do not expect anything more than to locate where the Challenger went into the water and possibly where it is now on the bottom of the Atlantic. If they're fortunate, that it will not be beyond the continental shelf, and it'll be in shallow enough water that at least the bodies of the seven crew members can be recovered. Jay Barbary at Cape Canaveral. This was, of course, known as the teacher mission because of civilian astronaut teacher Krista McAuliffe. Students at her Concord New Hampshire High School watched on monitors in the auditorium. As the shuttle blew up, they left in stunned silence. This has been an NBC News special report. I'm Bob Madigan, NBC News. This is NBC News New York. Continuous coverage of the shuttle disaster at Cape Canaveral. Along with Alan Walden in New York, correspondent Steve Porter at the White House, and correspondent Jay Barbree at Cape Canaveral, I'm Cameron Swayze. To recap briefly, the space shuttle Challenger exploded about a minute after liftoff from Cape Canaveral this morning at 11.38... So far as we know, all seven crew members were killed. The crews, the recovery crews, are still busy out in the Atlantic, about 18 miles off the coast from Cape Canaveral, but there is no indication that anyone survived this terrible disaster. Alan? Chuck pilot, Chuck, uh, test pilot Chuck Yeager says the uh, space program will learn and recover from today's explosion of the Challenger, and he predicts that NASA will not launch another mission until it knows exactly what went wrong. Yeager was a central character in Tom Wolfe's book on the space program called The Right Stuff, and he compared today's tragedy to something we mentioned earlier, that's the 1967 Apollo explosion that killed three astronauts, the fire on the pad. Then, as now he said, NASA would have to analyze all the data to find the cause of the explosion, and he expected the analysis to take a long time. He said he believed that NASA had enough data to give it an idea about what happened, but he declined to speculate about what caused the tragedy. Yeager was, by the way, the first man to break the sound barrier in 1947. In Manchester, New Hampshire, the home of Krista McAuliffe, the teacher who was flying on this mission, the students at the school were watching the liftoff. Allison Hart of affiliate WGIR went to the school and described the scene. Basically, it's one of shock, utter shock, and uh, it hasn't even begun to sink in yet, the realization of, uh, of the tragedy that's occurred up here. It, it, to try to describe the mood is it's difficult they're holding out hope that uh that maybe by some miracle uh krista is is still alive uh, i spoke to the principal charles foley the principal at concord high school who uh, ushered krista through the the whole selection process from 11,000 other teachers and he's grown close to her as as many people up here have and uh, he, he never in his wildest dreams had he imagined that anything like this could occur. He said he, he went from ecstasy and utter joy in watching the uh, triumphant liftoff to, uh, to, to, to shock and disbelief. And uh, it just went from, from joy and, and triumph and uh, history-making uh, uh, wonderful experience to, uh, to the, the most devastating tragedy in, in seconds. And uh, there was dead silence in, in the classrooms where television sets were set up for the students to watch what was happening with their social studies teacher. And uh, as soon as the, the impact occurred, as soon as the uh, explosion was seen on the television, it was, it was dead silence. It was uh, kind of a, an eerie hush that settled over the entire school. It was, it was incredible. That's reporter Allison Hart of NBC affiliate WGIR at the school who went to the school to see what happened in Concord, New Hampshire. One woman in Krista McAuliffe's hometown said the feeling is the same as on the day President Kennedy was assassinated. Allison Curling watched the shuttle launch in a restaurant bar filled with neighbors and fans of McAuliffe, the high school teacher. She says everyone cheered when Challenger rose from the pad, but when the spacecraft blew up, it got really quiet. 
Curling remembers being one of the first to learn that McAuliffe had been picked for NASA's Citizen in Space program. She said she felt like Paul Revere when she ran down Concord's main street spreading the news. In moments, she says, the whole street was cheering. Today, the city of Concord, New Hampshire, is in mourning for Krista McAuliffe. Cameron? Krista McAuliffe was uh, the first private citizen selected in national competition to fly on a space shuttle mission. She was 37 years old. She was born and raised in Framingham, Massachusetts. She earned a bachelor's degree from Framingham State College in 1970, later a master's degree in Maryland. She was selected from 11,146 teachers nationwide who applied in NASA's Citizen in Space competition. To prepare for the flight, she's undergone 100 and she underwent 120 hours of training at the Johnson Space Center. She's a member of a number of professional organizations with 15 years' experience in teaching, and the flight plan of the shuttle had tentatively called for her to teach, as they say, two lessons from space. Alan? Chairman, let's go to NBC News correspondent Jay Barbary at Cape Canaveral for an update. Jay? Well, we really have no updates this time, Alan. The rescue mission, what rescue mission there is, is still underway 18 miles due east of us where the shuttle Challenger went into the Atlantic Ocean. What can be done is being done at this time. Flight controllers at Mission Control are pouring through the tracking data. There was a little over a minute of it. They're looking for any sign whatsoever of what could have gone wrong. No one has the slightest hint at the moment. All right, Jay. NBC News correspondent Jay Barbary from Cape Canaveral. A quick recap of what happened. Uh, the space shuttle was a little more than a minute into its liftoff from Cape Canaveral, the shuttle Challenger today, when there was a tremendous explosion in space. So far, because the data was all normal until that point, we have no idea why the explosion occurred. But at that point, of course, Cameron, the shuttle was the equivalent of a flying bomb with all the fuel aboard its uh, two solid fuel rockets the fuel in the main fuel tank, the thing just disintegrated. No one could have gotten out, apparently. Alan, Dan Blackburn is standing by now at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, another center of space activity in the United States, where there was, earlier this week, considerable excitement as they processed the information flowing back from Voyager 2 as it flew by the distant planet Uranus. Dan, you've had time now to talk with some of the scientists there at JPL. What are you hearing about the implications of all this for the space program? Some of the scientists here, Cameron, are saying that they think this could result in a significant delay in the uh, manned flight space activity. An indefinite delay, certainly, to begin with. The shuttle program, while they recheck everything, one very knowledgeable scientist here, perhaps in a matter of overstatement, called today's tragedy the equivalent of the Hindenburg the dirigible, of course, that blew up and, for all practical purposes, ended the use of dirigibles. No one here, I think, really thinks that the space program is going to come to an end. But without question, there are many here who think that today's disaster will set it back a very long way, perhaps uh, disrupting totally many of the major programs that were scheduled to be done yet later this year and in the next. Thank you, Dan. Dan Blackburn at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. The space shuttle program already was running behind schedule. NASA was pushing to maintain a brisk shuttle pace, trying to prove to itself and to the United States and to the taxpayers, which have spent considerable billions of dollars to support this shuttle program, that there was a viable and realistic mission for the space shuttle programs and for shuttle programs that continue to fly so frequently. Let's go back now to the White House, where correspondent Steve Porter is standing by. Steve? Cameron, the president uh, came out of the Oval Office a short time ago, walked across the hall into the Roosevelt Room where a group of reporters had gathered for a briefing, and he, uh, he told them that he had no more hard information about what had happened than they had received from their own news organizations. But uh, he made it obvious that uh, he had uh, practically no hope that any of the crew members or the teacher, Krista McAuliffe, would be found alive. He said, uh, this is a horrible thing that we have seen. I can't help but think... Uh, what the families are going through. Uh, he was asked a number of questions at that, at that point. Uh, he agreed to answer a few of them. Uh, he was asked, first of all, about uh, the, the crew, uh, the launch crew, I should say, and about the cold weather, about the possibility of error. He said, I do have confidence in the people uh, who have been involved in the flight. He says, I want to find out what happened. He was asked about the possibility of uh, delays in the future. In fact, maybe even a total delay until uh, it is determined what exactly did happen. 
he indicated that, that that very well could be the case. But at the same time, he said, you know, we've gotten so confident about uh, these flights that when this sort of thing happens, it is especially shocking. And he said, you do have to go forward. And uh, if I were to guess, I would say that in tonight's State of the Union message, when he talks about this, uh, after expressing his shock and dismay and condolences, that he will say we must go forward, and he will probably give some hint as to what kind of policy we'll have from now on with respect to uh, whether we will allow a launch uh, before all of the answers are received satisfactorily from this tragedy. He was asked, what about Krista McAuliffe? Uh, how do you feel about the fact that this teacher was chosen uh, uh, much uh, from your instigation? And his response, well, look, all seven of those people on board were citizens. They were all volunteers, and they were all desirous of that flight. Uh, as if to say, we must think of all seven of the people aboard, not just the one. Although certainly the uh, Krista McAuliffe is certainly the one getting the attention on her family and the shock that they've felt. He said accidents happen in every line of transportation. And uh, they're going to happen in the, in the shuttle program. So what we have here really is a response of, of shock and dismay and at the same time a determination that, that we must go forward. I, I would also like to mention that Mrs. Reagan was watching the broadcast live when the exp when the explosion occurred and her response was oh god no and she went into a state of, uh, of of just shock she wouldn't say anything perhaps very similar to what everybody else felt uh, just disbelief uh, is the way one aide described it and that uh, she still reported to be uh, very much in shock much as as many of the rest of us are Cameron? Steve, Steve, the the president is a man whose emotions are often visible on his face. We've seen him at Bitburg. We've seen him at the ceremonies for Americans who are returning in coffins from missions overseas. What what did he look like today? Well, I did not see him personally. I was not in the group that was in the Roosevelt Room. I'm going to be talking to some of those men here soon. They're still in there. But uh, we do know that he expressed heavy concern. He was saddened. He... He showed anxiety as if uh, uh, there was something that might be done. It's a feeling that all of us have, I think, when we see something we really don't believe. We sort of want to do something about it ourselves. And apparently he had that same desire, expressed that desire to want to be able to do something and couldn't. It's an awful feeling. There's, there's no indication at all, is there, that he would postpone the State of the Union address tonight? Uh, in fact, the indications are just the opposite, that uh, he will go ahead with it and will probably make much of this incident because the space program means so much to him. And he was going to make tonight the space program and the look into the 21st century uh, a very important part of his State of the Union message. This was to be a speech, Cameron, of... Uh, of tone. It's, it was to be thematic. It was, uh, it was to be full of atmospherics. It was not to be full of uh, specific proposals and numbers and facts and figures. He was hoping to perhaps set a tone for not only the next year, but for the next three years of uh, his term in office. And I think it's interesting to note that uh, Thursday he was planning to go to, and probably still is, uh, a technical high school out in Fairfax County, Virginia, where he was going to tour some science projects all as a part of showing, through his State of the Union, his interest in the future of science and of high technology and things like the space program. Okay, Steve, thank you very much, and we'll be checking back with you, Alan. NBC News correspondent C.D. Jaco is standing by now, Cameron. He's been talking to some of the officials of NASA about this tragedy. C.D.? Alan, uh, the black smoke and the yellow fire that was smeared across the sky earlier this morning caused one high NASA official here in his Washington office to scream it's blown up, and then he started crying uncontrollably. That's at least how some other NASA officials describe reaction at NASA headquarters, which is right at the foot of Capitol Hill. Emotion, as you might expect, is running high, but there's one substantive question that is worrying some NASA officials, and that is how much heat will this create to cut back on manned missions? Some of the space experts, including some in NASA, say the space agency is spending too much time and just too much money on the manned missions and they say the spectaculars like the shuttle and plans for a space station are draining valuable funds from unmanned exploration. And some critics say scientists have learned more from the unmanned Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 missions to the outer planets than they've learned from the entire manned shuttle program. And one of the critics of manned spaceflight is Dr. James Van Allen, the man who discovered the Earth's radiation belt. And Van Allen was once asked, is there anything man can do in space that a machine cannot? Van Allen replied, of course, but why would anyone want to do it at such an altitude? Uh, NASA officials worry that this disaster could renew calls to cut back on manned exploration of space in favor of unmanned robots like the Voyagers. 
as to what happened. Only one NASA official I spoke to on background here in Washington was willing to even hazard a guess. He said the TV pictures made it look like that possibly the main fuel tank, the big tank strapped to the shuttle's belly, had somehow ruptured or one of the valves on it had broken off because he said the fire seemed to come from that area rather than the solid boosters. However, he emphasized that that's just a guess on his part and he's just looking at the same TV pictures the rest of us have been seeing, listening to the same coverage the rest of us have been hearing, and that he won't know for quite some time yet. Uh, there is yet to be an official... Uh, on microphone, on the record statement from NASA here in Washington. We're expecting that shortly, but uh, Cameron and Alan, right now, the, the mood is one of, of complete and total shock and uh, disbelief. Thank you, uh, C.D. Correspondent C.D. Jaco, it's interesting that the point was made about the valve because this uh, workhorse of the shuttle, shuttle uh, program, the Challenger, had a valve problem back in July uh, among its nine flights when all three engines shut down just seconds before liftoff. The crew of the Challenger include three trained pilots, an expert on lasers, the second American woman to fly in space, a Hughes Aircraft Corporation engineer, and, of course, Krista McAuliffe, the Concord, New Hampshire high school teacher. Uh, among the crew, Francis Scobie, 46, who commanded the flight and was making his second shuttle mission. Challenger's pilot was Mike Smith, 40 years old, the commander in the U.S. Navy. Uh, Ronald McNair was doing research on lasers at the time he was selected to be an astronaut, raised in Lake City, South Carolina. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Ellison Onizuka, 39, was a former aerospace engineer and pilot who uh, took courses at the elite Air Force Test Pilot School in California. Judy Resnick, uh, she's someone that I met uh, in early in the space program during the first of the shuttle missions down at the... Uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, 36 years old. Judy Resnick, a classical pianist who earned a doctorate in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland. Then there was Gregory Jarvis, 41, a Hughes Aircraft Company engineer flying on Challenger to conduct tests on the effects of weightlessness on fluid carried in tanks. And finally, Sharon Krista McAuliffe, the Concord, New Hampshire High School social studies teacher who was the first private citizen selected in national competition to fly in the space program there have been two members of Congress who've flown in the past, in the recent past, as a matter of fact, Republican Senator Jake Garn of Utah, who is a pilot, and Congressman Bill Nelson, the Democrat from Florida, whose district includes uh, Cape Canaveral. Cameron? Again, the Space Shuttle Challenger at 11.38 this morning, lifting off from Cape Canaveral on what appeared to be, at that moment, a routine liftoff with no warning from anyone in the cockpit nor any warning from the telemetry data streaming into the computers in front of the men in mission control. No indication of anything wrong at all exploded in midair about 60 seconds up, several miles into the flight, and, and I believe about 18 miles downrange. It was going more than 2,000 miles an hour, if I'm not wrong at that moment. We'll have to check later with Jay Barbry when it exploded. There was no chance, apparently, for them to deploy the jettison mechanism, the escape device that uh, would allow them to get the capsule in which the cockpit is enclosed off of the spacecraft to, to blow it away, much as the same way an escape seat works in a jet airplane. No chance for anything except the just horrifying plunge of that wreckage into the Atlantic Ocean, trading plumes of black, greasy smoke and, and white an orange from the rocket fuel spent and then burning as the as the as the wreckage from the crippled craft cartwheeled into the Atlantic Ocean and the nation and indeed much of the world that was watching on television watched horrified and and as everyone said President Reagan Nancy Reagan and others oh my god no it can't happen it's become so routine these space shuttle launches we we all now grope for some way to piece it together and see what comes next this is Cameron Swayze, NBC News, New York, along with Alan Walden. This is continuous coverage on the NBC radio network. 66, WNBC, and New York. we'll be with you until we hear from NASA and from uh, the White House until they, they expect to have an official statement soon, perhaps with some preliminary indication of exactly what went wrong. The... The data which they have needs to be massaged in their computers before they can make a reasoned determination. It's possible the solid fuel booster rockets, the two of them strapped to the outside of the space shuttle body itself, detached 
prematurely, as we heard from J. Barbary. He saw them spiraling off, apparently intact. It's possible the main shuttle engine in the middle blew up. One thing we do know, almost certainly, none of the seven fine crew members of the space shuttle Challenger survived. Cameron Swayze, NBC News, New York, Alan Walden, Steve Porter at the White House, Jay Barbary at Cape Canaveral on the NBC radio network. This is an NBC News special report, Calamity in Space. I'm Bob Madigan. The 10th mission of the shuttle Challenger, the teacher mission, ended in explosive disaster less than two minutes after it began. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Nothing could be done. The shuttle has apparently disintegrated into fiery bits of metal, all seven aboard thought to be dead. This was, of course, known as the teacher mission because of civilian astronaut teacher Krista McAuliffe. Students at her Concord High School, New Hampshire High School, watched on monitors in the auditorium. They cheered with the countdown of blue horns until someone yelled, Damn it, shut up. There's been a major malfunction. Shut up so that we can hear. Student Ted Kyle walked into the auditorium at that moment. Just surprised. It's just like... And we just walked in at the same time and just heard that it happened. At first we thought they were just kidding. Well, they were not. Disaster had struck. Krista McAuliffe's parents, husband, and two small children, Scott 9 and Caroline 6, were at Cape Canaveral watching the launch, and they saw the disaster. She was not the only one on this disastrous mission. The crew of the Challenger included three trained pilots, an expert on lasers, the second American woman astronaut to fly in space, a Hughes Aircraft Corporation engineer, and the flight commander. This was the first in-flight disaster in 56 U.S. manned space missions. This is an NBC News special report. I'm Bob Madigan, NBC News. New York, Steve Porter at the White House, correspondent Jay Barbary at Cape Canaveral, and this is continuous coverage of the shuttle disaster on the NBC radio network. To recap briefly, the space shuttle Challenger exploded about a minute after liftoff from Cape Canaveral this morning. The seven members of the crew apparently are all lost. NASA still has its rescue teams out in the Atlantic about 18 miles off the coast of Florida where most of the debris fell into the ocean, but it seems apparent now that no one could possibly have survived that horrifying fireball. President Reagan is stunned. He is disbelieving. He plans to go ahead at this moment, so far as we know, with his State of the Union address tonight. And New Hampshire, the hometown of the school teacher on this mission, Krista McAuliffe. The school has shut its doors. The cheers of exultation as the shuttle began to rise from the launch pad turned to sobs and cries of anguish as the students watched on a television monitor and saw their beloved Krista, along with the other members, perish as the rocket exploded and fell into the sea. And now the school has shut its doors, closed itself off to deal with its grief in private. The principal came out and ushered all the news media out of the building. Alan? President Reagan made a point of saying that there were seven people on this mission. It's important to remember there were seven Americans. They were all volunteers, and they all must be mourned. But most of the attention has been focused on the New Hampshire high school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, and students at her school in Concord were cheering at the blast-off. But the cheers disappeared rather quickly, and they sat in stunned silence as the space shuttle Challenger blew up less than a minute into the flight. The Challenger crew then uh, carried the uh, New Hampshire school teacher Krista McAuliffe and six other members: Commander Dick Francis, uh, Francis Dick Scobie, co-pilot Michael Smith, Judy Resnick, Ellison Onizuka, Arnold McNair, satellite engineer Gregory Jarvis. Interest on the trip centered, however, on the 37-year-old New Hampshire teacher Krista McAuliffe, who waited today's launch eagerly despite the many setbacks and delays. On July 22nd, McAuliffe dedicated her flight to her students. We see the space program as a science or math or technological um, adventure right now. I want the students to get a little bit of ownership. I want them to feel that they're part of the space age because they're the future and their children or grandchildren are going to be pioneering that. McAuliffe taught elementary school for nine years before joining Concord High School as a teacher in economics, history, and law. 
She'd been there for three years when NASA accepted her application to be the first teacher in space. She recently told reporters and fellow teachers that space exploration is not just for astronauts, but is in the future of every child. Krista McAuliffe's parents, Edward and Grace Corrigan, watching from the VIP site three and a half miles from the launch pad, hugged each other and sobbed as the fireball grew overhead after the explosion took place. For a moment, their hopes were buoyed by the sight of a parachute floating into the ocean, but it was a paramedic dropping to the crash site. Unlike the shuttle Columbia during its first flights at the dawn of the shuttle era, Challenger was not equipped with ejection seats or other ways for the crew to get out of the spacecraft during that critical two minutes of flight. Originally, there were two ejection seats for a pilot and co-pilot. Alan, but let, as the crew let crew, me interrupt for just a moment. We're going now to the first man in orbit, Senator John Glenn, who's making a statement in Washington. One morning talking about when there was a delay, commenting, when are we going to get this, this tur- turn this turkey into an eagle? Uh, we'd become so accustomed to getting these things off on time that safety was obviously being, uh, at least in that commentator's mind, uh, was being given uh, short shrift. Why aren't we running these things like a uh, regular airline schedule? Well, the fact that NASA has not done that. They've run it with the idea of safety first and foremost, and that's been the way it's been operated ever since the days when I was in that program many years ago. And it's a tribute to them that they have not been goaded under pressure to taking any chances. And we'll just have to wait the the accident analysis to see what happened in this case. Senator, were you watching the blast off this morning? I was not. I was in a classified briefing at the time, and uh, one of my uh, staff people uh, brought a note in to me about this, and then I left immediately and went up to my office. What was your reaction, particularly to the replays you've probably seen? Well, my reaction was a profound sense of loss, I guess, that this day had finally come that we'd hoped would never arrive. In some ways, I guess it's, uh, you know, in, in our human existence, I, let me be philosophical for a moment. I guess in our human existence, there is triumph and there is tragedy. And uh, man tries many things. And uh, we advance as a whole human race because we, because we succeed most of the time. We make advances, whether it's in space or engineering or health or medical things. Sometimes, though, we aren't perfect. And then there's a tragedy that uh, brings us back to our own human frailties and our, our lack of perfection. And so that's the kind of a day we're faced with now. It's been an amazingly successful series of triumphs through the years. But it also is fraught with the possibility of tragedy, and that's what we came up against today. When you say that this was a day that was pushed back for a century, was it inevitable that it would finally come? Well, I think any, uh, I think everyone that's ever had any connection with the program has felt that someday there would be a, a loss in flight. Uh, we're dealing with tremendous powers and speeds. You're traveling in orbit at five miles a second and trying to get back into the atmosphere from that kind of speed. And so uh, are we going to be perfect forever? I guess the answer was proven this morning that the answer to that is no. But uh, that doesn't mean that man doesn't keep trying in these areas and that we're not just as dedicated to seeing that this kind of research goes on. Senator, you've been, you've been part of a small and very select community of people, a community of astronauts. What does this do to that community when something like this happens? Well, we've never had something like this happen before, except for the uh, pad fire, or the the fire on the pad that claimed three lives. Uh, Gus Grissom, Ned White, and Roger Chafee back in uh, 67, I believe it was. Uh, So we went through that uh, tragedy then, but that was not an in-flight accident. Uh, Obviously, there will be... uh, Uh, a shared sense of loss in the whole astronaut group and community, everybody associated with the whole program, whether astronauts or all those in the the supporting functions. Uh, But I'm sure their dedication is going to be to to, uh, find out what caused this and correct it and get on with the next flight. Senator John Glenn of Ohio, who was the first American in orbit, the third American in space, talking about today's tragedy. By congressional decree, 
House Speaker O'Neill has announced the State of the Union address, which had been scheduled for tonight, has been postponed for at least one week. The official announcement is expected shortly from White House Press Secretary Larry Speaks. But, Cameron, we understand that the State of the Union, despite their earlier comments, has been postponed for at least one week because of the tragedy at Cape Canaveral and in this space. Now, that's not a surprising development, it seems to me. It would be in keeping with uh, the spirit of mourning that now will take over the United States. Jay, Jay Barbria is standing by now at Cape Canaveral. He's back with us. Jay, has anything at all come out from the telemetry or the data yet about, about what's going on? by looking at the videotapes, uh, having them slowed down and watching them very closely, it is apparent that the explosion began at the base of the external fuel tank. Now, this external fuel tank is 154 feet uh, long. It's 27 feet in diameter. It holds 500,000 gallons of hydrogen and oxygen fuel. And there are two tanks within it. And it feeds the, uh, these fuels to the three main engines of the shuttle through large ducts coming out of the bottom and going into the engines itself. All of this is disconnected after the three engines have done their job and they've put the uh, shuttle into orbit. The boosters are strapped to the side of it, the big solid boosters. They break away after they burn out. Well, just as the... Uh, astronauts were given the go for throttle up and the last thing we heard from mission commander dick scobie was roger understand we're go for throttle up at that point when he throttled up those three main engines is when that eruption took place now whether that had anything to do with it of course we don't know whether uh there was something wrong with the tank or uh there was a break in the tank or whatever but the explosion clearly began at the base of this huge tank holding 500,000 gallons, a half a million gallons of hydrogen and oxygen to feed these three main engines, a 15-story tall silo, if you will. And that is what exploded. And here was Challenger hanging on the underbelly of this huge tank, hanging down. And when it exploded, it appeared to destroy the uh, space shuttle Challenger. Jay, what did it look like when that uh, rocket exploded? Well, it wasn't a rocket exploded now. It was the big, huge fuel tank. It was the tank. You've got two solid booster rockets on the side of it. You've got three engines within the shuttle itself. These are the three prime engines. That tank feeds the fuel to these three prime engines. That is what exploded. And naturally, when it exploded, the other two rockets, the solid booster rockets, which are solid rockets, uh, just kept going. They went off in a direction on their own, and you could see them clearly go, come through the sky. And all we could see otherwise in the sky was this huge, elongated, uh, fiery debris, this big explosion. And we never saw anything larger than the solid booster rockets come down. Thank you, Jay. Correspondent Jay Barbary at Cape Canaveral. Again, to recap briefly, the shuttle Challenger has exploded on liftoff from Cape Canaveral. The seven crew members almost certainly dead. Word from Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House, is the State of the Union address will be postponed for probably two weeks. I'm Cameron Swayze with Alan Walden, NBC News. This is continuous coverage of the shuttle disaster on the NBC radio network. Ooh, you can really feel that temperature dropping. Better have plenty of delicious Campbell's soup on hand. A steaming hot bowl of soup's not only good for you, it makes you feel good, too. Because nothing's quite as soothing or satisfying, and nothing can make you forget the cold quite like Campbell's. So be sure to stock up, and be sure to eat your soup. Because with Campbell's, no matter how cold it gets outside, inside it's always warm and cozy. Campbell's soup is good food. Mary, the Knicks are playing the Chicago Bulls. Alice, the last thing I expected when you got Madison Square Garden Network is that Bill would turn you into a fan. Actually, I get a real kick out of watching Bill watch Patrick Ewing. When Ewing jumps, Bill jumps. When Ewing passes, Bill passes. But Alice, you sit through a whole game for that? Absolutely. The fun starts every time Ewing scores. Ooh. <laughs> Watch tonight at 7.30 as the Knicks take on the Chicago Bulls. See it live from Madison Square Garden, only on Madison Square Garden Network. NBC News. I'm Mike Moss. 
The space shuttle Challenger blew up today just two minutes after its perfect liftoff from Cape Canaveral. The shattered rocket and its seven-member crew fell into the Atlantic about 28 miles downrange from the Cape. It was such a massive explosion that it's hard to imagine that anyone survived, but NASA hasn't given up hope, and there's a huge crew out there searching right now. NBC News correspondent Jay Barbree is at the Cape. Jay, do you have any idea what caused the explosion? Well, Mike, it's apparent from studying videotape replays in slow motion, the explosion began at the base of the huge external fuel tank. Now, this is a 15-story tall giant that holds 500,000 gallons of fuel. This is the hydrogen and oxygen fuel that is fed to the three prime engines within the shuttle itself. And we saw on videotape without question the beginning of the explosion at the base of this external fuel tank. And when it did, the solid rockets went off and left nothing but fiery debris in the sky. Hey, Jay, thank you very much, and we'll keep in touch with you. With a look at the rescue effort, NBC News correspondent Jim Mikliszewski at the Pentagon. When the shuttle exploded, three Coast Guard cutters and two helicopters were in the search and rescue area downrange from the launch site. Within minutes, at least one paramedic parachuted into the sea in an apparent effort at a search for survivors. Two U.S. Navy ships in the vicinity sped to the area to assist in the search for possible clues as to the cause of the blast. Pentagon officials doubt there are any survivors. Jim McLeshevsky, NBC News, the Pentagon. I'll have more on this tragic story and more NBC News in a minute. Important news on colds and flu. If you're giving your family aspirin to relieve a cold or the flu, chances are you haven't talked to a doctor. Because Tylenol is the medication doctors recommend most for the aches, pains, and fever of colds and flu. You can trust Tylenol to provide effective relief without stomach irritation. So for colds and flu, give your family the pain reliever and fever reducer doctors recommend most. Tylenol. The Tylenol family of products for adults and children. Use only as directed. La Choy Kung Fu Theater. The La Choy is down this aisle, son. Hey, Ma, look at all the people by the La Choy Chinese New Year display. I wonder if there'll be anything left. Oh, no. Your father would be so disappointed. And we'd better get down there, Ma. What? Oh, Mom. No, Mom. Stop. Mom. No, not for stop. Mom. Gee, Mom. Gosh, don't you think they'd put out some more if they ran out of La Choy? Better safe than sorry, son. Have a happy Chinese New Year from... Let's joy. Let's go to Steve Porter at the White House. Steve? Mike, Deputy Press Secretary Larry Speaks came into the briefing room here at the White House a moment ago and made this announcement. The President, in consultation with the leadership of Congress, has decided to postpone the State of the Union address that was scheduled for this evening. He will address the Congress and the American people on next Tuesday. The President also said he is sending the Vice President to uh, the Cape at the moment. Uh, to uh, be there with the families and NASA officials, and uh, that he will make an address this evening from the Oval Office. We don't have a time as yet. Mike? And, of course, Steve, when that occurs, NBC News will carry the president's address live on both radio and television. That will probably be sometime tonight from the White House. This is NBC News. He had a vision that someday he would rule an empire so powerful that it would rival any nation on the face of the earth. Russian, hear me. I am your Tsar, anointed by God to serve you. His vision became Russia's destiny. Sunday night, an epic miniseries comes to NBC, starring Laurence Olivier, Omar Sharif, Vanessa Redgrave, Ursula Andress, and Maximilian Schell as Peter the Great. Peter the Great premieres Sunday at 9, 8 Central and Mountain on NBC. Ann Smith got a bargain on an exercise bike. How'd she do it? Called a few friends. And Mary Barnes got a great deal on a designer dress. Her secret? Connections. With AT&T Opportunity Calling, you too have connections. While making your usual calls with AT&T Long Distance, you can save on airfare, appliances, and now when you shop at JCPenney. Look for our catalog in the mail. And when you're asked how you saved, just tell them, made a few calls. AT&T Opportunity Calling. Another reason AT&T is the right choice. To recap the story, the space shuttle Challenger blew up today. This is how Mission Control in Houston reported it. Reports from the flight dynamics officer indicate that the vehicle uh, apparently exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water at a point approximately 28.64 degrees north, uh, 80.28 degrees west.
There was no announcement from NASA about the fate of the crew. It's believed that all seven crew members on board died. Among them was schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe. She's from New Hampshire. This was the first space flight by a truly private citizen. She was it. Other crew members were Francis Scobie, who was the, uh, the captain, Michael Smith, Judith Resnick, a veteran astronaut, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, and Gregory Jarvis. It appears as though they were all lost. This was the 25th space shuttle mission. It ended today in tragedy over the Atlantic, not far from Cape Canaveral. Mike Moss, NBC News. Chocolate Lovers Hotline. Carmine Jew Snopes here. I represent the Bar Association. And we've got a big problem with these little schoolboys by Lou. Present your case, Counselor. The little schoolboys are delicious butter biscuits topped off with a bar of pure chocolate. It's a cookie impersonating a candy bar. Uh, the Bar Association is mighty upset. What Bar Association is this? By the Chocolate Bar Association, of course. <laughs> a Chocolate Lovers Hotline. This is Jester Walpole the third fundraiser from the Asking for Dollars Institute. Hi, Jester. I've heard about these delicious little schoolboys boys by Lou, and I'd like to ask you to send me 50 boxes. Excuse me, if you're with asking for dollars, why asking for cookies? They're not just cookies. Besides, I'm used to asking for things. Widgets, walnuts, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you mind if I ask you something? Ask away. Would you mind getting off this line? Thank you. Little school boys by Lou. They're too good to be called cookies. When you're as good as Lou, Exactly what's going on out there now, 18 miles off the coast of Florida. What are, are there planes out there, helicopters, scuba divers? What, what should we expect to see in our minds as we try to visualize what's going on? Well, the first thing that happened, the scuba, uh, scuba divers went out with the helicopters, and uh, some of them uh, parachuted out. There's helicopters on the scene. We're looking on a monitor here out across the Atlantic. We do not have a picture of anything going on out there. But as Steve Nesbitt said, they had to wait for the fallen debris so they could uh, get into the area. But they're in the area now. They're in the water, and they're searching for uh, Challenger and, as I said, uh, the possibility of any survivors. But we don't see how that is possible. And they're out there now, and they have all the equipment focused, the equipment being boats, they got aircraft, they got helicopters, and they got the scuba divers. So they're doing everything possible at this time. I want to go back to the opening before uh, we were hearing Steve Nesbitt out of Mission Control. You asked a question about something seemed to explode or something? Yes, yes, I was... Uh, it's too soon to speculate exactly, but apparently, Jay, uh, one of those solid fuel booster rockets that are kind of strapped on the side of the shuttle body itself and look a little like Roman candles when they go off. Apparently, one of those blew up. Is that, is, is that right? Not that I know of. Now, I don't know, it, I don't know that it is not right, but I don't know it to be correct. Uh, we have had no indication here through Mission Control or uh, any other official source uh, what happened. Because as Mission Control said, as we had Steve Nesbitt on the air, none of the flight controllers saw anything whatsoever. And it happened a little past uh, um, one minute, and it was right at one minute and 15 second, uh, seconds into the flight. And the last uh, indication that we had that uh, from the crew was uh, when uh, Mission Control said, you're go for throttle up. Now, what this means is, that the engines are throttled as they go up. They're controlled by the commander in which he keeps the G-forces. That's the time your uh, body weight is of its normal one gravity. He keeps it below three Gs or three times your normal weight going into space. So as uh, the vehicle accelerates, they can increase this power to keep the acceleration maintained so that they can climb into orbit and get to the point that they want to get. But they want to keep this at uh, less than 3 Gs because they do have passengers now on board. In this, in this case, Krista McCulloch, a uh, school teacher from uh, Concord, New Hampshire. And so they were given go for throttle up. And I'll take this time right now, Cameron, and I will play this back and we can hear it. Engine throttling up, 
Now, right at this point, and you can hear a little crackling in the tape. A minute, 15 seconds. And 2,900 feet per second altitude, 9 nautical miles, downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. You can hear Steve Nesbitt still giving uh, the indications that he normally would, but at the time he was giving these indications, Cameron, the Challenger had exploded. We had nothing in front of us but blue sky and bright orange, and you could see these two solid booster rockets that you're talking about, where the Challenger gets most of its power to get into orbit. They were, spar they were spiraling away, spiraling away from the Challenger, and what was in the center of this picture over the Atlantic was this huge, elongated explosion of fire and debris and smoke. The only thing that appeared to us that was still intact were the solid booster rockets, and they seemed to spin away and go away. Now, were there not one of those exploded? I don't know. There's no indication now uh, that that could have happened. There's no indication. We had an ice inspection team on the pad before launch. There's no indication that a huge chunk of ice could have fallen off of something and had ruptured uh, a fuel line or something going from the huge tank to the uh, Challenger itself. There's many possibilities. There was uh, certainly nothing that indicated that uh, there was anything wrong. And you have to visualize that man himself does not launch one of these things. They are so complicated, they are physically launched by computers. And during the last nine minutes of this, and what they call the terminal countdown, these computers are checking and rechecking millions and millions of systems. And if they see anything at all out of uh, kilter, they will halt this launch as they have in the past. Jay, we're going to we're gonna come, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, we're going to come right back to you. We want you to stay with us. Uh, we're going to go now to the White House. The president has been uh, informed about this disaster. Correspondent Steve Porter is standing by at the White House. Steve, we, un we understand the president was interrupted by the vice president and uh, told of this tragedy. Yes, and uh, of course, immediately they turned on the television set and uh, the president just stood there. As uh, one official here said, he just stood in stunned silence. And just a few minutes ago, uh, the chief of staff, Don Regan, walking through a hall, was asked by some of us uh, how the president felt. And his only response was, he is stunned. Uh, the planning now for the rest of this day, of course, is, is up in the air. The president has a State of the Union message tonight. White House Deputy Press Secretary Larry Speaks told us that the president still was planning to go ahead with that speech, but he would almost certainly uh, talk about what had happened, the tragedy that occurred here today. Uh, I might mention, too, that, uh, of course, Christy McAuliffe was the teacher that was chosen under the president's suggestion that an American school teacher be sent into space on the shuttle. And uh, so this was more or less his, his pet shuttle uh, mission. And for that reason, this thing has to hurt perhaps more than if it had just been a Secret Service mission or one of the uh, the regular Navy missions where this kind of thing does happen on a classified or a military mission. But to, to have a teacher like this with all of the children and families uh, all across the country, not to mention in the school itself, their loved ones watching this thing and see it happen in front of them has to be a shock that's going to be felt uh, throughout this land. Uh, in terms of uh, now what the president will do, it's expected that there will be further statements out of the White House today. But they're going to be very carefully phrased because we really don't know what happened. And you really can't say, the president can't say, this is going to affect the space program or this is going to affect uh, the, the, the civilians in space program or anything else until you really have the facts in hand. There is going to be a lot of uh, expression of sympathy. Uh, there will, of course, be uh, long sessions of uh, discussion and planning and, and uh, talk about how the public uh, is going to react to this. Uh, I've already heard reactions from uh, reporters uh, who uh, have signed on to go into space themselves. And they're saying very flatly, Cameron, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe we better rethink that. Uh, and, and that worries. I'm sure that worries the president. That worries me. It would worry anyone that has a concern for the space program at this point, not to mention the, the people that died there today. Uh, I, I don't know what the president will do today in terms of a reaction. He may save it for the State of the Union message tonight. He may come into the briefing room here and express his sorrow. We, we just don't know at this point. Now, I'd like to add one thing, if I could, and perhaps you can pass this on to Jay. 
Uh, I did cover the first seven shuttle launches at the Cape and uh, got to know a little bit about, about them. Certainly nothing like what Jay knows. He spent so many years doing it. But I would like to, if I could, ask him a question if he's listening. And uh, we were able to watch all three networks here. And we were able to watch uh, the explosion from a number of angles. And it appeared that the, as Jay said, and, and he said correctly, that the uh, booster rockets, which burned for two minutes after launch, appeared to break away uh, from the vehicle uh, at or about the time of the explosion and went off on their own. Uh, the question that I would have that perhaps uh, Jay could address here is um, whether that breakaway may have occurred ahead of time, ahead of when it was supposed to, at the end of the two-minute period when those uh, boosters were spent. And that either could have caused the explosion or the explosion itself, whatever it was on board, would have caused the breakaway. But it does did not appear to me, from what I saw on three networks and CNN as well, that there was any explosion of a solid booster rocket. It appeared to be within the major fuel tank or the vehicle itself. Cameron? Thank you. Correspondent Steve Porter at the White House. In Washington, elsewhere, C.D. Jaco has been talking to important House members involved in government oversight of the space program. C.D., Steve Porter was just talking about uh, where does the program go from here, and although it may be premature since the morning will not be over for a while, but what, what are these people in the House saying? We had C.D. Jaco on the line and one of our little gremlins that uh, infects all technical devices has, uh, has gotten into the works and fouled it up. But we'll get to see C.D. and see what the House members who are involved in oversight of the space program are saying. We do have C.D. C.D., are you there? You've been talking, we understand, to some important uh, House members who are involved in the space program. What is their immediate reaction after, they, uh, after the stunned disbelief? Well, Cameron, at this point, obviously, there is no talk about what might happen to the space program. As you pointed out, it's too premature, but that orange fireball in the blue Florida sky hit Washington like a bomb earlier this morning. The House of Representatives had just come into session, and they adjourned immediately after a brief prayer for the astronauts aboard. California Congressman George Brown is on the House Science and Technology Committee. He's one of the leading congressional experts on the shuttle program, and we asked him what his reaction is. Shock. There's no other way to react to something like this. Uh, this is uh, undoubtedly the most serious accident that the space program has had. Congressman Brown is an acknowledged expert on the technical aspects of the shuttle program, and he does not hold out any hope for survivors. The explosion of the, of the rocket booster uh, probably ruptured the, uh, the shuttle itself, probably uh, uh, killed the astronauts at that point. Brown, of course, says that is just his opinion. There has been no word yet on the fate of the seven-person crew aboard the Challenger. Uh, any moment now, we expect to hear from Utah Senator Jake Garn and Florida Congressman Bill Nelson. Those are the two Washington lawmakers who have gone aboard um, the shuttle. And parenthetically, Cameron, to what Steve mentioned earlier, there are a lot of journalists in Washington, uh, myself included, who have applied to go on the shuttle. And some may have doubts at this point, but others are saying that, um, as Congressman Brown said, that accidents will happen, it's, it's, it's tragic, and there's no way yet of knowing why it happened, but his opinion and the opinion of a lot of people who follow the space program from this end is that this will not affect um, plans or, or funding, but at this point, uh, everyone is still too much of in a state of shock, Cameron, to, uh, to say much more than that. It certainly will set the space shuttle program back considerably. The shuttle program already uh, was running behind schedule. And now, of course, they have um, just logistically three operational shuttles as opposed to four, which in terms of scheduling, and I think Jay Barbary would know much, much more about this than any of us would probably throw the entire schedule for this year off. But right now, I'm, I'm sure that all over the country where you are in New York, here in Washington, at the Cape, um, in small towns across the country, there are prayers being said, and people are just in a, in a deep state of shock um, about this, Cameron. Everyone is shocked, even people who are newsmen and women, journalists who are used to trafficking daily, 
in the course of their professional life in calamity or are as we are here in the NBC newsroom stunned. There is uh, a certain amount of gallows humor that goes around a newsroom, and yet today when this shuttle blew up, our first thought was disbelief. We have been so accustomed in 56 man in space missions in the United States to success that the shuttle launches have become almost routine and when the shuttle did explode in that fireball that was clearly visible on the television monitors we all refused to believe it we thought it was simply routine we thought it was the staging the part where the solid fuel booster rocket separates it was not though in uh, just a very few seconds after that we heard the subdued voice coming from mission control and from uh, NASA saying they had no communication with a the spacecraft, they had lost that communication, and then the disastrous, calamitous word that apparently it had blown up, and that, in fact, is what has happened. The Space Shuttle Challenger, delayed for about three hours in lifting off the launch pad at Cape Canaveral this morning, was about one minute into its flight. Everything seemed to be going perfectly. It appeared at that moment to be a textbook liftoff the shuttle was climbing into a blue sky, and suddenly there was a huge orange fireball. The shuttle exploded, and although the seven crew people on board, including schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe, have not been officially declared dead, there seems no chance for their survival. I'm Cameron Swayze, and this is continuous coverage of the shuttle disaster from NBC News. Bridge of the shuttle disaster from NBC News. of the shuttle disaster from NBC News. The teacher in space shuttle mission ended in disaster just little more than a minute after what looked like an absolutely beautiful, flawless launch. The Challenger exploded into a gigantic fireball. Scott 9 and Caroline 6 were among the people watching the launch at Cape Canaveral. They were the children of teacher Krista McAuliffe. Her husband was there as well. All 1,200 students at Mrs. McAuliffe's Concord, New Hampshire High School were glued to the set. Students cheered wildly after liftoff, then all of a sudden a teacher yelled for them to be quiet because something appeared to be wrong. The only reaction from the children, it can't be happening. Well, President Reagan was in the Oval Office when the shuttle exploded, according to White House spokesman Larry Speaks. The president stood there in almost stunned silence. You could certainly read uh, the concern, uh, the sorrow, uh, the anxiety on his face as he watched. There apparently are no survivors in the shuttle explosion. This has been an NBC News special report. I'm Bob Madigan, NBC News. La Choi Kung Fu Theater. La Choi for Chinese New Year? Yes, husband. Ah, celebration. I'll go call the kids. Hmm, yes. La Choi Chow Mein. Hmm. Good. Intruders. Cut. Not while I'm eating the toy. By the way, I invited the neighbors to help us celebrate. Hmm? <gasps> then cook more Lachoy. They're probably hungry. Look for the Lachoy Chinese New Year display in your supermarket. WNBC News time is 12.46. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judy DeAngelis, and we are bringing you special news bulletins throughout the day today about the tragedy concerning the space shuttle Challenger, which apparently exploded in space about two minutes after liftoff this morning. It is believed that all seven of the crew members aboard died in the explosion. Paramedics have flown to the area of the Atlantic Ocean where debris would be expected to fall. We will be back in about 10 minutes with a complete update from the network newsroom. Right now, let's go back to the ground and come back home for a look at some of the stories that are happening around our area because there is 
Still more to come on the Donald Manis mystery and the growing scandal involving the city's parking violations bureau. In the first instance, Majority Council Leader Peter Vallone has today announced that Donald Manis will temporarily vacate his job as Queensboro president while the scandal simmers. Just who will fill in for him isn't known. Geraldine Ferraro, who is a Democrat and who was a Democratic vice presidential contender in the last presidential election, had offered her services free of charge, but the Democrats in the Queens County area said, basically, thanks, but no thanks. It's not necessary you do it, but we thank you for the offer. Mayor Koch, meanwhile, says he will not apologize for calling Manis a crook despite the fact that the two men are friends. Koch says if Manis did something wrong, which Koch says it appears to him he did, then he should step down. The lawyer for Donald Manis, Michael Armstrong, had a comment back to Koch about all that, and WNBC's Meredith Hollis was there to hear it. Michael Armstrong says Manis suffered a massive heart attack and is desperately ill, and doctors have said Manis can only hear cheerful news, otherwise his health could be further threatened. Armstrong says Manis doesn't know his friend Mayor Koch called him a crook, but he says the family is crushed and saddened by the mayor's unnecessary cruelty. The only evidence available to the mayor is a hearsay statement of a confessed driver who was trying to make a deal for himself. Armstrong says he'll talk to Manis soon, but he doesn't know now if Manis plans to resign or step aside temporarily until this investigation is over. Meredith Hollis, WNBC News. In the Parking Violations Bureau scandal, another Queens lawyer came forward to the U.S. Attorney's Office today saying he is willing also to implicate Donald Manis in a scheme about bribes and kickbacks. He says he will do it if the U.S. Attorney's Office reduces charges against him. Police in Elizabeth, New Jersey say a small wooden box containing some type of a bomb exploded today, injuring one of three teenage girls who had picked it up to examine it. Police say the injured girl, 14-year-old Maria Cruz, was treated at Elizabeth General Medical Center for a contusion to the right foot and a facial cut and then released. Apparently, the young girl found out that there was a bomb when she kicked the package. WNBC weather and more on the space shuttle tragedy coming up. News time is 1249. Better ways to do business. That's what your Southern New England telephone account representative brings you. Better ways to manage, to sell, to move information, to stay ahead of the competition for companies of all sizes. Our account representatives are your telecommunications experts, experienced advisors working with you to make today's world of business communications a lot less confusing. Better ways, better ways to control costs. Better ways, better ways to hire profits. Better ways, better ways to manage your business. Better ways, Call your telecommunications experts today, toll free, 1-800-272-SNET. 1-800-272-SNET. at 1-800-272-SNET, Southern New England Telephone. He's got a reputation for saving you money. He Ford, the only Ford dealer on Westchester Avenue in White Plains with big deals on every new Ford and out the whip the prices up all those other Ford dealers. Oh, you better be careful what you say about those other dealers. They'll cut you right off the radio. Don't worry, Keith Ford would never be cut. only Ford dealer on Westchester Avenue in White Plains with the full line of new Fords at low, low prices. He's got a reputation for saving you money. He's the only Ford dealer on Westchester Avenue in White Plains. He Ford the dealer. The only one. The only Ford dealer on Westchester Avenue. Key Ford in White Plains. Key Ford is affiliated with Merriam Motors and Key Lincoln Mercury in Connecticut. WNBC News time is 12.51. We are back with our coverage of the space shuttle tragedy that happened about 11.38 this morning when the shuttle Challenger 
took off from Cape Canaveral in Florida. About two minutes into the launch, something went wrong. Just what we don't know yet, something terrible went wrong, and it exploded in space. All seven crew members apparently killed. Ironically, it is the day after the 10-year anniversary of the only other fatalities ever involved in the history of the American space program. And they occurred when a fire in an Apollo spacecraft killed astronauts Grissom, White, and Chaffee. As for the seven crew members aboard the space shuttle Challenger today, they are Francis Scobie, 46, the commander of the flight, making his second space shuttle into uh, into uh, space, his second mission, that is, into space. Scobie was born and raised in Washington State, married with two children. The Challenger's pilot was Mike Smith, 40, a commander in the U.S. Navy. He was born and raised in Beaufort, North Carolina. Smith also is married and has three children. Ronald McNair, 36, was doing uh, research on lasers at the time he was selected as an astronaut. McNair also married, also the father of two children. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Ellison Onizuka, 39, a former aerospace engineer and pilot who taught courses at the Elite Air Force Test Pilot School in California, born in Hawaii, married with two children. Astronaut Judy Resnick, 36, a classical pianist who earned a doctorate in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland, born and raised in Akron, Ohio. Ms. Resnick was single. Gregory Jarvis, 41, a Hughes Aircraft Company engineer, flying on Challenger to conduct tests on the effects of weightlessness on fluid carried in tanks. Jarvis, born in Detroit, graduated from high school in Mohawk, New York, married. Uh, no children. Sharon Krista McAuliffe, 37, the first civilian in space, perhaps the best known of this particular shuttle mission. She was selected from over 11,000 teachers who applied for NASA's first citizen in space competition. She is married and has two children. Now, we are going to be bringing you more on the space shuttle tra tragedy. We are going to be going over to the network newsroom desk right now with Cameron Swayze, and he will bring us up to date on the latest information. Cameron? We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. A terse announcement from Mission Control telling of the worst tragedy in the history of the American space program. The shuttle Challenger blew up less than two minutes after liftoff from Cape Canaveral. Aboard, in addition to six professional astronauts, was New Hampshire high school teacher Krista McAuliffe. Her students were watching the launch in their conquered classroom. Happy sounds, then noises made by kids enjoying themselves, then stunned silence. We tried to talk with teacher Harvey Smith, who was with the students when the explosion took place. Uh, I have to hang up. Uh, we, we got a directive from the administration uh, to uh, cut off all media, and they're asking the media to leave the building. NBC News correspondent Jay Barbary is on the line from the Cape. Jay, what's the latest from there? Well, the latest is that we have recovery crews, Alan, out over the Atlantic. The impact of the Challenger space shuttle was 18 miles due east of its launch pad here, and the recovery forces are out there now. We have boats, we have scuba divers, helicopters, aircraft. Uh, they had to hold back for a while because a lot of the debris was still falling from the sky, but they're on the scene to see if anything can be done uh, or if there's anything that can be recovered and any at all. A possibility, any slight hope of a survivor. Thank you, Jay. The worst tragedy in the history of the space program. More on that and other news in a minute. Dr. Wayne to emergency stat. Dr. Wayne to emergency stat. In the hospital, stat means right away. And when you have a sore throat, you want pain relief right away. That's why our fast-acting sore throat lozenges are called Sepastat. Sepastat, stat, stat, stat. With an anesthetic action that temporarily relieves minor sore throat pain, stat. Sepastat, stat, stat. And because sore throats often come with coughs, look for Novahistine DMX. Novahistine, a cough cold name known and recommended by doctors. Novahistine DMX. Use only as directed. When your eyes don't make enough tears to relieve burning, itching, dry, irritated eyes, you may have moisture poor eyes. Try Bausch & Lomb Moisture Drops. The special moisturizing formula speeds lasting relief to irritated eyes. Unlike the leading eye drops, you can use moisture drops as often as needed. 
remember, moisture poor eyes need moisture drops. Use only as directed from Bausch & Lomb, first choice of eye care professionals. NBC News correspondent Steve Porter is standing by at the White House with uh, administration reaction to the tragedy of Cape Canaveral. Steve? Alan, the space program, of course, is one of the president's favorite projects, and this mission would have been his pet mission because he pushed to have a teacher put into space. Christy McAuliffe, uh, well, her apparent death is almost sure to have made the shock felt by the president even worse than had it been just a strictly military mission. Officials here say that he stood in stunned silence as the debris fell into the sea, but that he's still going ahead with a State of the Union message tonight and, of course, probably will talk about this tragedy. Alan? Thank you, Steve. A terrible calamity at Cape Canaveral. The destruction of the space shuttle Challenger just about two minutes after liftoff. This is NBC News. Ragu pizza quick sauce on a toasted English muffin with some mozzarella cheese. Tastes like my neighborhood pizza parlors. In fact, it's got more zest to it. The sauce is excellent. You get some mozzarella on your lip. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting you all wrapped up in your cheese. <laughs> You're getting all wrapped up in pizza quick sauce. <laughs> That's right. Ragu pizza quick sauce. Big pizza taste on little English muffins. Delicious. I love it. And to top off any pizza, try new Ragu pizza quick pizzeria toppings. Three delicious blends of pizzeria seasonings you just shake on. Look for them in the spice section. You don't have to be part of the crowd. Be who you are and stand up proud. Say no. Just say no. If someone offers you drugs, just say no. You don't have to by the Advertising Council and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. As were all of us, members of Congress were stunned by the catastrophe at Cape Canaveral this morning. NBC News correspondent Bill Drudy is on the line from Capitol Hill. Bill? There is a deep sense of shock here, Alan. When news reached the House floor, the Speaker, Tip O'Neill, shook his head and said, it's a terrible thing, a terrible thing. The chaplain called for a moment of silent prayer, then Congress adjourned for two hours. At the office of Florida, Congressman Bill Nelson, who flew the last shuttle flight aide, said the congressman was devastated. He called members of the Space Science and Technology Subcommittee together, and they'll have some kind of formal statement in about two hours. Alan? Thank you, Bill. Bill Grudy, reporting from Capitol Hill. To recap what happened, the shuttle liftoff was delayed again today until 11.38 Eastern Time. And then about a minute after the launch, between one and two minutes after the launch, there was a tremendous explosion in space and debris from the shuttle fell into the sea. It is unlikely that anyone survived the worst calamity in the history of the space program. I'm Alan Walden, NBC News. WNBC News time is 12.59. We are back with more coverage of the space shuttle crash. As you know, all seven crew members aboard the space shuttle Challenger are believed dead following a mid-air explosion about two minutes after launch this morning. Now, on Long Island, there is another teacher that had been among the finalists to go on today's shuttle flight. Krista McAuliffe from Concord, New Hampshire, was the teacher that was finally selected from over 11,000 applicants. Out on Long Island, there was one teacher who didn't get to go. Debbie Gross talked with her. Susan Agrusso of Quorum says she was watching the blast off that could have included her on TV when she witnessed it all. I just saw the explosion and uh, heard the, you know, heard the news announcer saying something and in total disbelief and I, it's been played I don't know how many times since we've been sitting here and it's still an almost unbelievable happening to us. Did she say to herself she was glad she wasn't chosen for the mission? Oh, no, we were all a part of this together and I just feel so very sorry for her family and her kids. Debbie Gross, WNBC News. It appeared at first to be a very normal launch. I was watching it myself in the newsroom. It was a beautiful blue sky, crystal clear weather down around Cape Canaveral. The Space Shuttle Challenger lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center, trailing a plume of white smoke, and it did appear to be a perfect launch. The ship was climbing, smoothly trailing a 70-foot geyser of fire 
when suddenly it erupted in a huge fireball and shot out of control. Not to make light of the circumstances, it looked like something out of Star Wars. A Star Wars almost an unbelievable sight. A voice at Mission Control said, we are checking with recovery forces to see what can be done at this point. He added, contingency procedures are in effect. We knew at that time there was something terribly, terribly wrong. We knew then the vehicle had exploded. What we did not know was that NASA believes all seven crew members aboard had perished. We will be back with more on the space shuttle strategy in a moment. News time is 101. Go Goodyear and save money two ways. First, you save with Arriva Goodyear's gas-saving all-season radial. And second, you save on Arriva prices. And now through February 1st, Goodyear authorized retailers all over New York can put your car on Arriva's at appealing sale prices. Get the year-round performance you need with Arriva's aggressive interlock tread that delivers top traction in any weather, sun or snow, wet or dry. And when you add these special savings to Arriva's long-wearing, fuel-efficient construction, you've got a tire that'll save you money now and all year long. Get great deals, too, on raised white letter Eagle ST radical, ra radials and Wrangler radials for your light truck, van, or RV. This really is a sale that has more than one way to save. So stop in now at the authorized Goodyear retailer nearest you. Goodyear's money-saving Arriva sale is the way to go. But go now because saving stop February 1st. Goodyear is a shadow traffic sponsor. Good gear, tires, and on the service for more good years in your car. When the sun goes south in winter to the grand land of the Andes and brings to Chile summer's golden days. In soft sun, fruit is growing while it's winter in America. In orchards and in vineyards far away. It's winter here in summer in Chile. Grand Union has a treat in store for you. Chili and nectarines are the red dot special this week at Grand Union. Treat yourself to a summer snack. A variety of chili and fruits is waiting for you at your nearest Grand Union. Grand Union always has good things in store for you. WNBC News Time is 1.03. I'm Judy DeAngelis. We are back with our continuing coverage of the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion in space this morning. Today's explosion of the Challenger was the first in-flight disaster in 56 U.S. manned space missions. The $1.2 billion spacecraft, which burst into a monstrous ball of fire moments after liftoff, was one of four shuttles in NASA's fleet. It is a devastating setback for NASA, which has carried out 24 space shuttle missions in less than five years. Although this was the first in-flight disaster, there was a tragedy on the launch pad during the Apollo program. Three astronauts died in 1967. Astronauts Grissom, White, and Chaffee when fire swept through their Apollo capsule during a launch rehearsal. President Reagan watched in stunned silence as television broadcasts told of the disaster. The president had been in a meeting when he was informed of the explosion by Vice President Bush. Spokesman Larry Speaks describes the president as saddened and anxious over the accident. Also shocked by the accident, a group of New Hampshire school children that were in a class taught by Krista McAuliffe, the first civilian in space. She, one of the seven crew members, apparently, who died aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger today. We are going to be going back to our network uh, coverage now of the Space Shuttle disaster. Mo momentarily, momentarily, Judy. Meredith Hollis did have an opportunity to talk to some folks downtown. Here's one of the reactions. Well, it's a tragedy, certainly. But also, I think we've been a little bit overambitious in what we've tried to do with the space program, and I think uh, we need to um, reconsider a little bit um, how far we want to go in trying uh, to um, expand our horizons in space. It's a tragedy that the teacher went because, um, you know, those are the, it's one of the hardest working professions, and it would have been such a great triumph to have that teacher in space. And so I think it's really... Um, it's really hard to take. So man and woman on the street reaction garnered by WNBC's Meredith Hollis right here in New York City.
down near the launch pad at Cape Canaveral were Krista McAuliffe's parents who were watching that liftoff, obviously watching in horror as the space shuttle exploded into a ball of flame. Now, exactly what happened, we do not know. NASA does say rescue teams are now being allowed to enter the area of the Atlantic where the shuttle debris has fallen. They were not admitted to the area earlier because the debris continued to rain down from the sky over 45 minutes after the shuttle exploded. Now, we are going to be having coverage from our network newsroom. It's just a matter of time. But uh, first of all, let's take a break for some commercial messages. WNBC News Time is 106. Is tonight going to be just like every other night? Are you going to watch the usual hospital and police stories on TV tonight? Or the same old game show? The time has come to tell you about something new and exciting in the air in New York. Cooper Wireless Cable. With HBO and WHT, Cooper Wireless Cable offers two commercial-free channels to choose from without cable. Featuring over 120 star-studded movies every month. Plus, world championship boxing, music videos, local professional sports, great family entertainment, and late-night eye-opening adult films with full VCR compatibility. And when you sign up for one year of HBO and WHT, you save up to 70% on the second channel. Call 1-800-222-6700 today if you live in Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, or the Bronx. Or look for the Cooper Wireless Cable ad in TV Guide. Ask about their special one-year free installation offer for individual services, too. That's 1-800-222-6700. 1-800-222-6700. Cooper Wireless Cable, the best of cable TV, without cable. WNBC News Time is 107. Let's go directly now to the network newsroom for more coverage. Know, but about 60 seconds into the flight, as the shuttle lifted off into a clear blue Florida sky with no indication that anything was wrong, no warning from the crew, no warning from the instruments on the ground, no expectation of anything going wrong, suddenly there was a huge orange fireball. The shuttle exploded about uh, two miles up, Pieces of debris rained down, trailing plumes of white and orange smoke as they fell into the sea about 18 miles off Cape Canaveral, where recovery teams now are at work. It appears that all seven members of the crew are lost. No one was more stunned at what happened than NASA. As far as mission control to get, could determine, nothing at all had gone wrong during the final seconds of the countdown. To repeat, we had a... Uh, Apparently normal ascent with the data coming to all positions being normal up through approximately the time of uh, main engine uh, throttle back up to 104 percent. At about approximately a minute or so into the flight, uh, there was uh, an apparent ex explosion. The uh, flight dynamics officer reported that uh, tracking reported that the vehicle had exploded and impacted the water in an area approximately located at 28.64 degrees north, 80.28 degrees west. Recovery forces are proceeding to the area, including ships and a, uh, a C-130 aircraft. The commander of this space shuttle Challenger flight was Francis Scobie. He was from Washington State. This was his second space shuttle mission. NBC correspondent Bob Bazell, who covers science for NBC, says Commander Scobie lived with the knowledge that someday, maybe, the worst could happen. I remember one night we were driving back uh, from the launch pad, and he said to me that someday one of these things is going to blow up. I remember this conversation very well. He said, it's a very complex piece of machinery. It has a lot of explosives on it. He said, well, someday, like, like there's bound to be airplane crashes, he said, someday one of these is going to blow up. Of course, this was a very special flight because aboard was the school teacher from uh, uh, New Hampshire who had captivated the hearts of the nation, Krista McAuliffe, 37 years old. Her parents were at Cape Canaveral. They watched that shuttle go up. They watched and stared in utter disbelief as the thing exploded and fell apart in midair. In New Hampshire, at Krista McAuliffe's high school in Concord, the students were cheering, and there were bells ringing as the shuttle lifted off in the first seconds when it appeared that all was going well. Suddenly, when it exploded, there was a stunned silence. Some of the children sobbed. Others buried their heads and their hands on their desks. 
And the superintendent of the school very shortly came out, uh, stunned as is the whole nation, and ordered all the members of the news media out of the building. They are keeping their grief for the moment to themselves and trying to cope, as are all of us, with this sudden blow to our our national pride. Uh, psychologist Joyce Brothers is with us now, and perhaps we might discuss that a little bit, Joyce. We we wonder, for those children and for for others around the nation, even for adults, what what should be said now? We've come to regard space shuttle flights as, as routine, as, as routine as an airline takeoff. And now suddenly this overwhelming disaster strikes us. How, how are Let's say parents, for instance, how are parents to handle it? Well, I think it's very important for parents to realize that they must interpret this for their children. Uh, when Krista McAuliffe uh, took the, uh, the task of going into space, she said she saw this as an extraordinary opportunity. But I think it's going to enhance the teaching that I do, get the students more excited about their future, which is important. And she said this before blastoff. And I think for s- children to feel that the future is important and exploration is important. I think it's um, uh, valuable for parents to say to their children, in any movement in which we have learned something new, there has been a risk. If human beings were unwilling to take risks, we'd still be living in caves. But we don't take reckless risks. We try to find all of the safety precautions. We try to find as much as we can uh, in terms of the knowledge about what the risk is. And we balance the good and the bad. The good of exploring what is there, of making the unknown known, outweighs the individual risk that people take. And Krista McAuliffe will live in history as a very courageous woman who wanted to make exploration in space important, valuable, and understanding for children. And that if we let our sorrow at her loss keep us from feeling that space exploration is part of our future and an important part of our future, that she would have died in vain. A lot of these young people have grown up with a space program that, despite the minor delays and so forth, has been one success after another. We have never lost anyone in space. This is the first indication to them that this vaunted space program and our high technology is not uh, absolute perfection. Is that, do you see any fallout from that? Well, of course there's fallout, but in all of life, we must look at failure not as failure bad, but as failure learn. When a scientist does uh, a study and they discover that they are going in the wrong direction, they do not consider that that is lost. They have learned that that direction is not fruitful. We learn not from our successes. We learn from our failures. And if we allow this failure to wipe out our interest in space for children, then it is truly a failure bad. But if we say, what can we learn so that it will never happen again, then something can come out of this terrible tragedy. Thank you, psychologist Joyce Brothers. And if I may just add a personal note, it would be uncharacteristic of us as a nation, the nation that went into space, to let this deter us over the long run. Alan Walden is here with me now, Alan. You know, Cameron, this is not the first tragedy in the history of the space program. There was one serious one back in 1967 when uh, astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were killed on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral in the Apollo 1 fire. But this is, by any measure, the worst we've ever seen. And uh, here we lost seven people, apparently. NBC News correspondent Sid Davis is standing by in Washington. Sid... A congressional investigation, uh, Alan, is certain to parallel NASA's examination of the tragedy that befell the the Challenger. There are many in Congress who have been critical of the space program for its enormous costs, and some have questioned the wisdom of sending humans along on the missions when robots and other electronics are capable of much of the same work. So Congress will want to ask whether NASA's shuttle program was too ambitious, whether haste in preparing for the flights could have been a factor. But one of the big boosters on Capitol Hill for the program is Senator Jake Garn of Utah. He flew one of the shuttle missions. He says NASA should not fly again until it determines what happened today. 